We all know about floating inputs by now, when you're trying to use something like a microcontroller pin, a high impedance input, to read a signal, but there's no signal there. So what you actually read is a spurious voltage from noise and whatever else. And we know we avoid this by having a pull-up or pull-down resistor. But what if you don't want to necessarily lock the signal with a pull resistor? What if you want to detect the fact that it's fluting? Like if you have an I.O. port in the back of your device, and you want to be able to display a light or talk to the user or whatever, if they don't have something plugged in, you want to detect that. And there's various ways to do it. Some do it by conductivity of the shell around the plug or whatever. But you can straight up detect a floating input. But how? Well, you can't use a pull-up or pull-down resistor because that completely overrides the floating condition and there's no way to detect it. And there's no way you can just read a floating input and somehow detect that it is. You're just going to get a voltage. It'll be a wrong voltage. It'll be a nonsense voltage, but you're just going to get a voltage, not some secret code to say this is floating. But there's a magic trick you can pull, and I'm going to show you three different ways to do it. Each of them is better and worse in different situations. So that's why I'm going to give you all three, because you're going to want all three in different times. But the basic principle is, what if you could use a pull-up and pull-down resistor at the same time? So think about this as a truth table. You have your input. Your input could be a high signal, a low signal, or high impedance, which we say Z, high Z. If you use a pull-up resistor, high is high, low is low, and high impedance floating is high. If you use a pull-down resistor, high is high, low is low, but high impedance is low. We can see a difference here. If we could somehow get all this information at once, because this is not enough and this is not enough, but together we could see both high, both low, or inequal, and we could tell the difference between the three. But if you just add a pull-up and pull-down resistor at the same time, you don't get what you expect. So let's say you have an input signal, and you have something reading that input signal. So there's that, but of course you've got a floating input. So you add a pull-up and a pull-down resistor at the same time. Let's say they're the same value because there's no reason to really have them different values. The point is not to have current over them anyway. So there's a pull-up and a pull-down resistor. What else is it? It's a voltage divider. It looks like it's trying to bias the signal, but the signal doesn't get biased because there's, you know, the, the, the next impedance is the thing that's doing the reading. So it basically just shorts across this voltage divider, and it does absolutely nothing. You know, it, it drains current through itself, and that's it. It doesn't even affect the signal, except when it's floating. So for this, high is high, low is low, but floating. If this signal is not here, we have a voltage divider into the signal reader. So 5 volt supply, you're going to get about 2.5 volts. And your microcontroller digital pin can't read that. That's within the indeterminate range. Your pin is going to read high here, low here, and unknown in the middle. You're going to get a high or a low. Your microcontroller, when you try to read this, it'll give high or low. But useless. However, it does lead directly into option one, the simplest option, but not a great one in my opinion. Microcontrollers have analog pins. If you want to use one, you can go ahead and read this signal with an analog pin, and within a margin of error, you know, discard the last bits or whatever, and you say if it's, you know, close to the full voltage, then it's high. If it's close to the zero voltage, it's low. And if it's close to the middle, then it's floating. That'll work. Boom. Done. But not every microcontroller has analog pins. The ones that do, they're usually precious because they're the only ones that can do the analog thing. They're not all analog pins. And reading an analog pin is slow. It's 100 or 200 microseconds. That's really slow. So using an analog pin is not really a great idea. But if you have an analog pin to spare and you're working on a human time scale where less than a millisecond is not anything, then there you go. That'll work just fine. But let's say that's not a good enough option. Let's say you want to use a digital pin to read it so that it's faster. Well, then you can't use that voltage divider because the digital pin can't properly read half voltage. But what could read half voltage? We want to think about cheap parts here, parts that you can get in bulk that you're probably going to have laying around, such as op amps. I have an entire box full of dual op amps. They're pennies each. They're one of the, the cheap chips, the LM358N. I have oodles of the things, and they're small. They're only eight pins for two op amps. An op amp 
in open loop mode, open loop gain, with no biases or anything, is just a comparator. It's a differential amplifier. So basically, any difference at all, it's going to slam against one rail or the other. Mine doesn't give the full voltage, but it gives more than enough to turn on a transistor or be read by a digital pin. But how do we do that? Let's have another voltage divider. This idea occurred to me because I'm familiar with a 555 timer, which uses three identical resistors, which may or may not be 5K, to create two-thirds and one-third voltage. And this is how it creates a region. Once again, you have the trigger region, the threshold region, and the stable region. In a 555 timer, it turns on when you go below a third, it turns off when you go above two-thirds. The same idea works here. What if I have two op amps? And again, this is one chip, one single chip, one little dual op amp chip. I have a signal that we know is going to be high, low, or half voltage. Two-thirds and one-third are plenty distant from half. They're not right next to each other. You don't want to run an op amp close to zero, you know, when the two voltages being compared are very near each other, because it could flip back and forth and you could get high-low, 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 high-low with noise. But this is plenty far apart. So what if we want to say, is this signal higher than two-thirds? That's going to be a high. So we connect that there, two-thirds, we connect there, and the output here is high if this signal is high and low otherwise. Then, what if we take this signal again? Let's bring it around. Let's put it here. If this signal is less than one-third, it's definitely low. You see, the voltage divider is providing a reference voltage to compare to, just like it is in a 555 timer. If the signal is higher than two-thirds, it's a high. If the signal is lower than one-third, it's a low. So now, we need two pins, and thus the downside of this method. But it makes sense because a digital pin can read two values, high or low. But we need to read three values. Well, you can't put three values in a two-value box. You have to have two bits which could hold four values. So we end up with a truth table. If the input is high, low, or high impedance, this E signal and F signal. For a high, this is going to be high and this is going to be low. For a low, this is going to be low and this is going to be high. And for half voltage, for the floating input that's got a pull mid, we could call it a pull mid resistor pair, pulls a floating signal to half voltage, which is less than two thirds and greater than one third. So both of these end up low. So you can read both of these and you can tell high, low, or high impedance. Also, let's say you don't want to read it with two digital pins, let's say you want to plug it into logic. Let's say you have some other logic IC or just some gates put together. In that case, you can just use these as inputs to those, and you could just use one of the signals even. You could put it into a NOR gate. When both of these are low, it's floating input. So hook that into a NOR gate. NOR is true when both inputs are low. So then you could feed that NOR gate into one microcontroller pin or into an LED or whatever. If you're only interested in detecting whether the signal is floating or not, and then you could have the signal go somewhere else, not even in this. This could just be the detector of the floating. And you could send the signal somewhere else to a different chip to be read whenever this one says it's okay, something's plugged in. However, you want to hook it up. So this is beneficial because you can hook it up to digital logic. And if you're only trying to read one or two pins and you have the digital pins to spare, this method's pretty good because it's combinational. It's constantly updated and always available as the input changes, just like a combinational logic chip. There's a propagation delay, but as long as you're not trying to read it too fast, whenever the input changes, these op amps are going to be updated and you can read them without any shenanigans. But it does take more pins. So now for the final method that requires fewer pins, because let's say you have eight pins to read, this would take 16 pins, or plug it into 16 gate inputs or whatever. But the final method uses only one or zero extra pins, depending on how you do it. So eight pins could be nine pins or eight pins. And we don't need this voltage divider anymore because we're using a new trick. The reason that this doesn't work is because both of these together make a voltage divider. But what if we could select pull up or pull down? What if we could say, give it a pull up, read it, give it a pull down, read it. Then we're back to that original truth table where we can say, if we got high both times, it's high. If we got low both times, it's low. If we got 
get different answers is floating. But how do we do that? How do we select a pull-up or pull-down resistor? How else? With transistors. Let's have a PNP transistor and an NPN transistor. Standard configurations, base resistors, but if this NPN opens up, then it has a low impedance path to ground. If this PNP opens up, it has a low impedance path to high. So that sounds like a pull up and pull down resistor to me, doesn't it? So let's say we have our input signal and then we have our digital pin reading that input signal. So here we have the standard floating input and then we could connect the pull up and the pull down resistors to it. So if we turn on one at a time and then read it, there you go. So how do we do that? There's your extra microcontroller pin, a digital output. Just hook that up to the bases, and these are simple digital switches. They're either in cutoff or saturation mode. They're not acting as amplifiers, just switches. When I is high, then the PNP is off, the NPN is on, you get a pull down resistor. When I is low, the NPN is off, the PNP is on, and you get a pull up resistor. So you can have this signal and you only need one pin for any number of pins because they'll each have their own base resistors, but the signal is shared. So you turn them all to pull up or all to pull down resistors at the same time. So all to pull up, read them all, all to pull down, read them all, and now you have your tri-state. But let's say you don't even want to spend that pin. What can you do that requires not even one single extra pin? Got a square wave? A square wave is just a signal that goes high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. So if we have a square wave generator and we use that to trigger the signal, then you're going to have pull up, pull down, pull up, pull down, alternating at whatever frequency the square wave is. Nice 50%. You could use a microcontroller pin PWM output, a microcontroller pin just switching back and forth, but that's what you are already doing, or any square wave source, such as an oscillator, a 555 timer. If you have four resistors, two capacitors, and two transistors, you can make an oscillator. You can make, I think it's a NAND, or no, it's an inverter oscillator. There's a million different ways to make a square wave. So make a square wave and plug it in. You have to control the frequency. If the frequency is too low, then they're not going to switch fast enough and you're going to have a lot of latency because you have to have it switch high and then low. So one full wavelength, one full period rather, of the square wave to detect the signal change. So if that's too long, then you're waiting too long. But if the frequency is too high, then you can't read it in time. You know, it's whatever the limitation of your microcontroller is. So just pick a nice middle of the road frequency that's fast enough so that you're not waiting too long for the signal, but slow enough that the signal isn't leaving you behind. And if the signal is high, then it's just going to be a high signal no matter what. E is going to read a steady, unchanging high because the signal's just shorting across. You're getting current back and forth through the pull up and pull down resistors, but they're not affecting the signal. So E will read high if the signal's high, E will read low if the signal's low, and if the signal is floating, it's going to be a square wave. So you can detect that the values are different, you can detect a square wave, whatever you want, and there you go. So no extra pins, you just need some square wave source. The last thing to mention is that this must never be floating. And I mean, it can be floating if you're not using it, but in order to get a valid reading, you must have high or low on these pins. Because let's say you don't have a signal, then what you get, this is still there, what you get is positive through emitter base, through base resistor, through base resistor, base emitter to ground. So they're turning each other on through their bases. And then since they're both open, you've got positive through emitter collector, through resistor, through resistor, collector, emitter, and ground. We've got that voltage divider again. So if this is floating, then it's going to be applying half supply. So a high will be high, a low will be low, and floating will be half voltage. And there's no way to read that with a digital pin anyway. If you have an analog pin, you don't need any of this. Just read it with the voltage divider. So there you go. That's how you can read a floating input with no pull up or pull down resistors specifically to lock the signal. They're being used to detect the floating rather than just obliterate it. So this is useful whenever you need that information, whenever you need to know it's floating. But for me personally, I'm about to do a video on how you can use an Arduino Uno to check combinational logic chips, like you got your, your adders and your muxes and demuxes and whatever, your encoders, decoders, to basically put the chip in a breadboard, wire it up to a no-no, and it'll run through every single 
possible combination of inputs to check the outputs. And it works, I've already done it. So it's, it's basically quality testing to make sure your chip 100% works for every single possible input combination. If you've got 512 input combinations, the Uno is going to do it in less than a second. You are not. But if I have a chip that can use high impedance outputs, such as an output enable, like something like a bus transceiver, there's no way to really test that because I would have to use pull up and pull down to really get an answer. But with this, I can. I can have one pin, have it read, switch, read, just like before I talked about the square wave, and I can check those too. You may never need this, but you still learned something. So while you decide if you ever really could put this to use, I'll be seeing you.